On March the 3rd, 1792, the cream of English society gathered at St. Paul's Cathedral to pay their respects to a departed compatriot. But this was not the funeral of an aristocrat. Instead, the ceremony was in honor of a portrait painter, a man who created over 2,000 portraits and was the first president of London's Royal Academy. His name was Sir Joshua Reynolds, and he was the founder of the English School of Art. There can be no doubting the status of Sir Joshua Reynolds, an English master. Reynolds is certainly one of the most important figures in the history of British art. Uh, probably he is to be valued first of all for introducing a new sense of status. His position as the first president of Royal Academy uh, established that institution as the leading institution in Britain. He, he lifted English art up out of uh, what one might call the mire, where, where nobody had really taken any notice of it and um, got it hanging up on the walls of the Academy. The Academy needed somebody like him. He, he might have been a bit of a conservative in, in an era that was actually beginning to verge more towards Romanticism. But uh, he gave um, British art a, a coherence and a, and a kind of uh, strength. Reynolds certainly managed to raise the status of English art and gave it a fresh direction as it moved towards the 19th century. Reynolds was born on July the 16th, 1723, in Plimpton, a small town in Devon. From a young age, Reynolds was passionate about art. In 1740, his father sent him to London to study under Thomas Hudson. Reynolds spent three years with Hudson, but left before the end of his apprenticeship, having seemingly learned little. By the age of 21, Reynolds was able to make a living as an artist, despite having no formal qualifications. Over the next six years, he worked in both Plimpton and London. In his hometown, he was able to secure portrait commissions from naval officers based in nearby Plymouth. During the 1740s, Reynolds started to develop his own technique. His self-portrait of 1740 has an unusual richness of texture. After learning this technique from an obscure artist in Devon, Reynolds began to use the thick impasto brushwork that would become an enduring feature of his painting. I think that Reynolds' brushwork is probably first distinguishable by the breadth that it has. He paints rather thickly and uh, he paints rather smoothly, but it gives it uh, quite a sense of volume. You feel that his figures are very full, so to speak. They, they have a dignity and you feel that the brushwork really goes in with that as well. By 1749, Reynolds was back in Devon, continuing what was a moderately successful career as a portraitist. But Reynolds had higher ambitions, and a chance meeting with a young naval officer, Commodore Augustus Keppel, gave him the chance to pursue them. The two men struck up a deep friendship almost immediately, and Keppel suggested that Reynolds join him on his forthcoming voyage to the Mediterranean. On May the 4th, 1749, aboard HMS Centurion, the 25-year-old Reynolds set sail from Plymouth. His work would never be the same again. A quarter of a century before, Michelangelo. At this period in the 18th century, there, there evolved um, an idea that certain forms of painting um, were more uh, valued than others. The pinnacle of art, so far as patrons of the 18th century and artists of the 18th century were concerned, was history painting and history painting was considered to be a form of painting that was above other ideas in art and it required its own particular style of painting which became known as the grand style and the principal artist uh, whose work exemplifies his style uh, is Michelangelo uh, 
Reynolds liked Michelangelo in the first place, I think, because he represented the intellectual artist. Reynolds was somebody who really was very keen on trying to emphasize the importance of the artist being a thinker as well as a painter. And he saw Michelangelo's wonderful designs as being ones that were the product of considerable thought uh, and very deep ideas. He referred to Michelangelo as sublime, and I think this idea of the poetic side of his work, taking you out of the ordinary, uh, these great heroic figures uh, performing mythological or religious deeds, uh, this really excited him. Reynolds travelled widely, admiring the work of the Bolognese painters, including Annibale Caracci. He also discovered the work of Rembrandt and was keen to study classical sculpture. He visited Venice, where he was profoundly impressed by the works of Tintoretto and Titian. I think, frankly, that if he hadn't gone to Italy, that possibly Reynolds might be um, not particularly well known today, because uh, there were very many competent um, painters around at the time. Portraiture was very popular, and although he would always have earned a very good living, without the inspiration of light and colour that he received from Italy, I think he wouldn't have developed his work to the extent where we think it's as good as it is. He was very uh, much uh, bowled over by Michelangelo, but also he saw lots of other pictures there which were uh, in, the, in the same period as that of Michelangelo. And it, whilst he was there, he made lots of copies of, uh, of pictures, which he later used in his own work when he got back to um, England. So in a sense, you might say his paintings advertise he's been to Italy uh, when he shows a, f uh, a portrait of somebody in the pose of the Apollo Belvedere or something like that. It shows that he knows this art and he can somehow absorb the dignity of the classical world with it. And that's what people wanted for a stylish portrait painter, somebody who would make you look very grand, make you look like a work of art yourself. So I, per I expect that was probably the most important things in terms of Reynolds' career. Reynolds was keen for viewers to be aware of the great influences that exerted themselves upon his work. He grew convinced that perfection in art had already been achieved, especially in the work of Michelangelo, and it was now the job of artists to attempt to achieve the same perfection. The key to this was academic study of the old masters. But Reynolds' own attempts to discover the secrets of art did lead to occasional errors of judgment. In Venice, he was fascinated by the rich brownness in the paintings of Tintoretto and Titian. This effect is a consequence of the physical age of the work. But Reynolds was keen to replicate this effect immediately with paint. It led him to use pigment loaded with the coal derivative bitumen. The results were disastrous. Bitumen is a kind of pigment that is based on coal tar and essentially it's something that never dries and this means that as the centuries go on um, it gets, keeps on shrinking but never gets perfectly solid and as it shrinks it basically breaks up the paint surface so you get this hard black developing with lots of horrid cracks in it and everything that it was mixed with just simply disappears. Uh, he used it because he thought it was a way that would give him nice rich tones like Rembrandt, uh, but really he was cutting corners and he paid the price for it. Quite often the pictures cracked before they even left his studio, so it was, uh, it was rather disconcerting for the people who received the pictures. And um, quite often he had to go along to their houses and, uh, and touch them up a little bit. And some of them are still so bad that, you know, they can't be, they can't be repaired, I'm afraid. Reynolds' use of bitumen was an unfortunate consequence of his passion for the old masters, but it had beneficial effects on his work. In the summer of 1752, he returned to Devon and prepared to incorporate his newfound knowledge into his own paintings. His artistic career was about to take off, and that meant returning to the English capital. In early 1753, aged 30, Reynolds relocated to London for good. That summer, he painted a portrait that made him famous. It was a fame he would never lose. <laughs> 
This is a full-length image of Commodore Keppel, reflecting the artistic knowledge that Reynolds gained in Italy. The figure of Keppel is based on the Apollo Belvedere statue, while the brooding seascape reveals the example of Titian. It is a dramatic and original portrait whose sense of movement and vitality was almost unprecedented in an English portrait at the time. You don't necessarily at first know that it's the Apollo Belvedere because, of course, Commodore Keppel is wearing 18th century captain's uniform and he's striding along the seashore, but he has the same um, attitude of arms and legs as the Apollo Belvedere. So I think what Reynolds was trying to do was to enhance his portraits by using um, former historical um, pictures and, and sculpture to back them up. In those days, uh, it was absolutely precisely what people wanted because it, it, um, it massaged their egos. It made them feel that they were part of this um, high art uh, echelon. Uh, what he did was he narrowed the gap between history painting and portraiture and he created um, a whole new genre of painting uh, which became uh, known as the historical portrait. The success of Commodore Keppel led to a stream of commissions for Reynolds. Everybody within English high society wanted a Reynolds. He was totally at ease in the upper echelons of society, a situation helped both by his Italian experience and his ever-increasing prosperity. He was also not afraid to flatter his noble subjects. In this image of the Earl of Lauderdale, the Earl stands proud in his finery, his elbows resting gracefully on a classical column, the coronet reinforcing his status. The posture is derived from ancient sculpture, while the influence of Van Dyck can be seen in Reynolds' use of the column. Considering Reynolds' passion for the techniques of the past, his own technique was surprisingly unorthodox. Reynolds could hardly draw. He painted directly onto the canvas. Reynolds didn't draw. He wasn't a particularly good draftsman, and this might have influenced him. But I think as well as that, he probably felt that painting directly onto the canvas gave him that sense of form and shape very rapidly, and that was something that he liked to achieve. Reynolds' painting technique may have been unusual, but it worked. Portrait commissions flooded in, and by 1763, he was able to charge 150 guineas for a full length. He leased a substantial property in Leicester Fields, the site of present-day Leicester Square, and his adjoining studio buzzed with artistic activity. Reynolds' workload was very heavy because he became more and more popular. Um, I think he had up to six clients a day, which to cope with, which is quite extraordinary. He knew how artists with studios had tackled this, for an artist, a nice problem, but a problem nevertheless. Therefore, he was able to organise it intelligently. He began to employ assistants. And in fact, from that time, most of the portraits were largely done by his uh, assistants. And he would come in and, uh, rather like Rubens, uh, he would come in and touch up details of the face and the hands and pull the painting together. He had a um, um, principal studio assistant, a man called Giuseppe Marchi, who was an Italian who came back to England with him from Italy and remained in his studio right up to his death. He was there for 40 years. And Marchi was basically the person who managed the studio and probably did an awful lot of the painting of Reynolds. I mean, Marchi, in a sense, ought to be looked into because he probably did more Reynolds painting than Reynolds himself, if one thinks about it. But there were also lots of other people, people who specialised in drapery, um, people people who could do scenery, people who could do still life, and so on and so forth. So it really was a production line, and that was the way that uh, he would work. The output of portraits from Reynolds' studio was prodigious and lucrative. But portraiture was still seen as a poor relation in comparison with history painting. Reynolds, the portraitist, was desperate to prove himself in this far more respected branch of art. But commissions for history painting were scarce in mid-18th century England. His response was ingenious. 
he decided to incorporate aspects of history painting into his portraiture. Reynolds was fascinated in the way that history painting produced all these poses, partly because in history painting you have to tell a story visually, you have to tell it by gesture, you have to tell it by expression, and that means that the history painter has a very highly developed skill at posing and showing expressions, and Reynolds was fascinated by that. When uh, Reynolds produced um, uh, portraits of people, he would uh, look to the character of each individual sitter uh, and then uh, look in history for all of the different uh, uh, stories in, in the classical world. And then, as closely as possible, he tried to um, uh, mould the, the, the story from the classical world into the nature of his character so that the character, in, in effect, took on that role and that classical story became part of the painting. It elevated the portraits. It made them that much better than they you know, really were. Um, for women, he tended to use um, goddesses or, or uh, you know, people from Greek mythology. But for men, he would more or less take pictures, he would adopt characters from pictures in, in history paintings or would actually use sculptures. So this would actually elevate the, the portrait that he'd actually painted because he did believe that history painting was the best, but nevertheless he couldn't actually manage it very well himself, so, so he, uh, this is a sort of middle way. To the modern audience, some of Reynolds' history portraiture appears extremely contrived. This image of the three Montgomery sisters is important, because its classicism was unlike anything ever seen before in England. It is the layout of the composition that is, perhaps, the most admirable feature of the canvas. Reynolds was now in the most formal classicist period of his career, and his mastery of design in images like this remains an admirable feat. When it comes to paintings like the three ladies adorning the term of Hymen, Reynolds brought this idea of the high art portrait to its absolute fullest pitch, to its culmination point. And the whole uh, scene becomes part of a complete mythological um, uh, image, like a, like a whole mythological story. On one level, this is a portrait of three sisters, but it's also a commentary on their lives. One of them is about to be married. She's the one on the right who is standing in white. And you could say that you can see a kind of progression from the left to the right. The youngest daughter who is picking the flowers up from the ground, passing them to the second daughter who is making a garland, passing them to the third daughter who is then going to adorn the statue. So there is a narrative going on, moving towards the statue of Hymen, which is the statue of marriage. Reynolds has uh, managed to make it look fresh, natural, and disguise the fact that every little part of that picture has been very carefully composed. He has managed to use composition, light and shade, colour, to, in fact, achieve a real sense of unity throughout the picture. For many, it is Reynolds' less academic portraiture that possesses the greater appeal. The influence of the past is reflected in images such as Georgiana, Countess of Spencer and her daughter, from 1761. Here, the positioning of the mother and child is derived from the established Madonna and Child format. In Reynolds' paintings of women, it is often the sense of real, living humanity that impresses us most. This is evident in Mrs. Abingdon as Miss Prue, a 1771 painting of a well-known figure of the London stage that reveals the warmth of colour that characterises much of Reynolds' finest work. The Wallace Collection in London is home to some of Reynolds' most impressive female portraits, including this canvas, Nellie O'Brien. Reynolds' Nellie O'Brien portrait is by far his greatest work. He's taken more from 
studies and ideas that he got from Rembrandt uh, and from Rubens rather than from Michelangelo and Raphael, particularly, in fact, with the, the shaded uh, eyes and the shaded face uh, with the large brim of the hat. Her face is completely in shadow, but it's a wonderful luminous shadow. You can see this sort of subtlety of expression, and he's used that shadow to make her face look more tender and more subtle. And perhaps this is the key behind the real appeal of the work, that wonderful subtlety of expression and naturalness that you feel from it. The, the light and the shade gives this effect of, of her sitting out in the open air, which is actually quite rare for the period. And I think that that gives it a much fresher and, uh, and more natural appearance than some of his historical portraits. And in fact, actually, it's, it's about as close to, to the work of Gainsborough that Reynolds was ever to, to come. Although Reynolds' portraits reveal a deep sensitivity to the feminine character, he remained a lifelong bachelor. He had a relationship with the brilliant Swiss artist Angelica Kaufmann, but it appears that Reynolds was simply not the marrying kind, and he lived by himself in Leicester Fields, with his sister Frances keeping house for him. Reynolds was far from lonely. His portrait commissions made him the acquaintance of hundreds of aristocrats, and in 1760, he joined the new Society of Artists. The real friends of Reynolds were writers, he was on intimate terms with literary figures such as Oliver Goldsmith and James Boswell, and he painted portraits of both of them, as he did with the philosopher Edmund Burke. He also formed a deep relationship with the writer and lexicographer Samuel Johnson, who was the subject of several Reynolds portraits. When Reynolds paints his friends, he seems to get a kind of intimacy into his pictures, which you don't find in his more formal commissions. His more formal commissions were based upon, uh, quite often upon historical precedents that he'd seen in Italy, in paintings and in sculpture. But those of his friends, I think he must perhaps have discussed with his friends how the painting would look. And so he wouldn't bother much with the historical precedent. He would paint the picture uh, in friendship, I suppose. They be become a much more natural portrait of people, but they, they come across as men of distinction rather than um, some of the rather more overblown portraits that, that we see in these historical portraits. I think there's something rather relaxed about them. There is a kind of informality, almost as though he knows them as people, he knows their gestures, he knows their personalities, and he's using that knowledge in the portrait. He's not just portraying what he sees, he's also painting what he knows. Because he was able to relax rather more, um, I think that these portraits are, are among, among his finest, really. Another of Reynolds' famous sitters was his friend David Garrick, a man regarded as the greatest actor of his age. But in this image from 1762, we see more than just a portrait of a giant of the stage. Reynolds depicts Garrick torn between two women representing comedy and tragedy. The two women personify virtue and vice, and Garrick has made up his mind in favour of the latter. The vice's attraction is strong, and Garrick's facial expression makes it clear that he cannot, or will not, resist, much to the irritation of the stern, upright figure of virtue. The painting remains one of Reynolds' finest achievements. Reynolds' painting of Garrick between tragedy and comedy is a wonderfully theatrical picture, and perhaps it's a perfect tribute to the greatest actor of the time. Garrick is showing his poses and expressions, but typically for Reynolds, they're being used very much to tell the story, the story of the choice that he has to make between tragedy and comedy. And you can see that kind of mixed expression in Garrick's face, as so though he's going with comedy because he likes it, but he's still regretting leaving tragedy behind. So I think it's the way he handles that narrative, which is perhaps at the basis of the picture's greatness.
But there's something else which is very characteristic of Reynolds, uh, the great variety he di displays in the picture. Comedy is painted in a rather light, almost fluffy manner. Uh, if one was thinking of great painters of the past, we would associate it with Correggio, the great uh, 16th century painter of wonderful uh, sort of vaporous nymphs and, and, uh, and Venuses. Um, tragedy is painted in a very sober manner, uh, rather like the Bolognese classical painters who Reynolds admired so much. So you can see this great variety moving from the sober style uh, to the more exotic style. By the time this canvas was completed, Reynolds was almost 40. He was at the peak of his powers, an artist whose status was about to be formally recognised. Throughout the 1760s, the Society of Artists had organised successful exhibitions in London, and many in the artistic community began to argue for a more permanent, established institution, a Royal Academy of Art. King George III welcomed the idea, but only on the condition that its president was Reynolds. So, in December 1768, by the King's command, the Royal Academy of Arts was created under the leadership of Reynolds. A new era for English art had begun. An academy was the thing that would give painting and the other visual arts status in Britain. We have to remember that by this time, academies had already been well established in Italy and France, and indeed in most countries in continental Europe. The academy was the professional organisation. It was the way of showing that a painter was a professional, like a doctor, or like a lawyer, or like all these other groups who would have their own kind of professional body. And the idea was that artists should be able to pass on their ideas and their knowledge and their skills and their abilities um, to uh, up-and-coming new artists in Britain. The other reasons why the Academy were established were, uh, first of all, exhibition. They held an annual exhibition. One of the big changes in Britain in the late 18th century is the growth of exhibition culture. People selling their pictures and showing them through exhibition rather than working simply according to patronage. It was both a marketplace, people, place where people sold pictures, but it was also a place of status. So it implied that the work that was being sold there was of very high quality. That idea became um, really very successful. The Academy greatly enhanced the prestige of art throughout the 18th century and on into the 19th and, and the 20th century. And in fact, the Academy still uh, hosts some of the great exhibitions of the 20th uh, century. So it still has a major role to play in the art uh, in, 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 in British society. The Royal Academy is now located at Burlington House in London's Piccadilly, and its administrative structure is virtually unchanged from that established by its first president. In his 15 annual lectures or discourses, Reynolds emphasised the value of industry and labour, of learning from the old masters, just as he had. He was dismissive of the idea of natural genius. Hard work and classical technique were the key to the creation of great works of art. It was a suitably academic philosophy. Reynolds, I think, was fundamentally conservative in his view of art because he saw himself as wanting to keep the academic tradition going. He believed, like the great academics in the past, that there was one standard of art, one great standard of art, and that all art should be judged by it. The highlights of that tradition was classical antiquity and then the great painters of the High Renaissance like Raphael and Michelangelo. Um, and he really believed that you couldn't go beyond that. He believed that, in a sense, what one was trying to do was to come up to that standard. Reynolds believed that art could be learnt, um, that great artists were made and not born. Art is a subject where one needs a certain amount of uh, basic uh, uh, inspiration, basic understanding of the medium, but that uh, understanding, that way to handle it, can be enhanced through learning, through teaching. And Reynolds, I think, um, understood this very well. So his, his philosophy, his conception, might have been rather conservative, 
Um, but in many ways, he was actually rather, uh, he was really right. He saw himself as reviving a classical world, a world of eternal values, and he thought that was far more important than anything that would be associated with fashion. Unsurprisingly, Reynolds used his Royal Academy discourses to argue that history painting was the highest form of art. Earlier in his life, he had been inspired by the examples of Michelangelo, Raphael and Rembrandt. None of these great artists were, primarily, portraitists. It was events from the Bible, or history, or mythology that provided the subject matter for their greatest work. Reynolds was keen to follow in this tradition, but on the occasions when he did receive commissions for history paintings, the results were often disappointing. Death of Dido, from 1781, is an unfortunate canvas that reveals Reynolds' inability to fulfill his ambitions. If Reynolds' entire body of work consisted of paintings such as this, he would not have secured his status as an English master. It is one of Reynolds' tragedies, I think, that although he wanted to be a history painter, his history paintings on the whole are pretty dire. And it is, it does worry me sometimes to try and work out what is wrong with them. And I somehow, I think, whereas he could very happily introduce dramatic elements into his portraits, somehow when he was on his own, if you like, trying to tell the full story, something went wrong. He's trying for something very dramatic, and yet somehow he can't quite convince you. Um, now, as well as that, I think often his painting is not very good in these circumstances. It's almost as though perhaps you could say he responded more to painting somebody who he was looking at and who he could react to as a real person. And um, he didn't really know what it was to invent in that way. It, it is a curious fact, and yet he is remarkably uninventive, I think, in his history paintings. Reynolds' quest for legendary status did not stop there. With his friend, Dr. Johnson, he conceived an ambitious scheme to decorate the interior of St. Paul's Cathedral. It came to nothing. A commission to design stained glass for Oxford's new college was also only partly successful. Reynolds' desire to create a great historical masterpiece was, ultimately, frustrated. But with this one large canvas, Reynolds perhaps came closest of all to realising his ambition. This is the fourth Duke of Marlborough, surrounded by his family. Painted in 1778, it is an image whose artistic inspiration stretched back centuries. This is not a straightforward portrait of a family group. Once more, Reynolds sought to work within the grand manner of history painting. And on this occasion, the results were spectacular. I think that the portrait of the Duke of Marlborough and his family shows a very strong influence of Italian classical painting, particularly of the 17th century, the painters from Bologna, in the way that it handles this large group of figures. And I think he was wanting to show that he could handle a really grand composition of lots of figures together, and this family uh, gave him the opportunity. He composed the picture very, very carefully so that um, the Duke and the Duchess looked rather sort of stern. In fact, the Duke is holding a cameo of, uh, of Augustus. But the children, the younger children, are looking uh, much less stern. They're, they're rather playful, and the dogs are also rather playful. So there's this balance of, um, of haughtiness and playfulness within, within the picture, um, which comes across very strongly, I think. He was also aware he was painting for a very grand setting, for Blenheim Palace, um, where you've got this huge Baroque palace uh, with tremendous pomp in it. And I think he was trying to paint something that would naturally fit in, would fit in with the great, uh, all the swags and, and all the great uh, spaces that you find there. So I think it's him showing him at his grandest, saying this is what you can do with a portrait. This is how you can really do a huge composition uh, and give it tremendous dignity and grandeur.
The later 18th century was a good time to be blessed with such a talent. A vogue for child portraiture had developed amongst the aristocracy, and they were prepared to pay large sums for paintings of their children. Like his predecessor, Hogarth, Reynolds sought to introduce a sense of life, even fun, into his images of youth. The painting of children can often be a taxing business for both artist and sitter, but Reynolds had no difficulty in holding the attention of his younger subjects. The Wallace collection houses this image of Miss Sarah Bowles, a painting that tells us much about the artist's personal skills. It is said that Reynolds visited this little girl the day before he was to paint her and spent the whole day with her telling stories and playing games. The next day, the young Miss Bowles was so overjoyed to see the artist again that the tedious business of sitting for the portrait became a sheer pleasure for her. The joy in the girl's face as she holds her pet would seem to confirm this well-told tale. Reynolds has an extraordinary sympathy for children, something that one wouldn't immediately expect because he seems to be rather a dignified, rather pompous person, but he clearly enjoyed children's company and I think he enjoyed finding their mood, finding their personalities, responding to it. One might also say that uh, his attitude to children was a little sentimental. This was the taste of the time, the um, attitude towards children was becoming uh, more sentimental. And in fact, of course, the closer to the 19th century, the early 19th century you get, the more sentimental um, pictures become. Reynolds also has a hint of mischievousness too, and often his children are very playful. So perhaps, in a way, maybe he just enjoyed children as a release, something away from his world of grandeur, and something where he could see perhaps a, a lost child of his in, childhood of his own, when life seemed to be much simpler and much easier. By 1781, Reynolds was famous and wealthy. His art collection was possibly the finest in London. His discourses to the Royal Academy were highly regarded, although not by all who attended them. The student William Blake railed against Reynolds' artistic conservatism during his brief studies at the Royal Academy. Thomas Gainsborough also had little time for the Academy president's emphasis on industry and technique. Gainsborough was now considered by many to be the best portraitist in England, a real rival to Reynolds' status. Sir Joshua did, on occasions, refer to his fellow artist in unkind terms. But this may be the only remotely unfavorable aspect of Reynolds' character that ever revealed itself. And the two great English artists were emotionally reconciled shortly before Gainsborough's death in 1788. By this time, Reynolds was also nearing the end of his life. In addition to his other honours, he was also created mayor of his hometown of Plimpton, and he became the official painter to the king. He was also awarded an honorary doctorate by Oxford University. In his final years, he still sought the inspiration of the old masters. In 1781, he visited Holland and Flanders and soaked up the achievements of Peter Paul Rubens. Reynolds was already um, a very experienced painter when he uh, went late in life, quite late in life, to um, north of Europe. But even so, I think that he did, in fact, um, learn quite a lot from Rubens because Rubens, particularly in his handling of um, women and children, has such warmth of approach as well as colouring that uh, I think one can see this in... Um, Reynolds' work when he got back. I think that, that uh, Rubens does seem to become more important to Reynolds later in his life and maybe in general one finds in the last decade of his life, in the 1780s, he is sort of loosening up a bit and he likes the ebullience of Rubens. Perhaps one of the most charming examples of this is his portrait of Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire, with her young 
daughter, where the countess is sort of throwing her hands back and playing again with the little baby who is sort of responding on the other side. And that is very Rubensian in its sort of fullness. And Rubens, of course, who was a great painter of voluptuous women, well, Georgiana was quite voluptuous herself. And you can see this in the gestures and also in the rich colours that he uses in the picture. By the time this vividly expressive image was created in 1786, Joshua Reynolds was already a sick man. His deafness continued to plague him, and he had also suffered a stroke that left him partially paralysed. Later in the decade, his sight began to fail, and by 1790 his health was frail. That year he delivered his final discourse to the Royal Academy. Reynolds' last discourse, which was delivered when he knew himself that he was dying, and so it has a rather tragic side to it, is a kind of summation of what he felt the Academy was about. And he begins by saying how important the Academy has been for Britain, um, how important it has been for introducing a new status for artists, how important it has been for introducing dignified exhibitions, and finally how important it has been for instructing the young. And he sees his own role, not just as a painter, but as a deliverer of discourses, as somebody who will provide this instruction. And he therefore wants to end, if you like, with his last good piece of advice. And his last good piece of advice is to imitate Michelangelo. One of the reasons he gives for imitating Michelangelo is he says, Michelangelo lived in a heroic age, we don't live in a heroic age. Therefore, in order to approach the quality of Michelangelo, you have to imitate Michelangelo. You have to do things like him, you have to absorb Michelangelo, as though it's no longer possible for artists to do that kind of work for themselves, which of course is what Michelangelo himself had done. That's one of the paradoxes of the academic position is you're telling people to copy other artists who whom themselves copied nature. Uh, and so you do have this rather sad side. But what comes on most of all, I think, is Reynolds' great commitment to his art and his very genuine love for Michelangelo and the very moving way in which he ends the discourse with just the word Michelangelo itself. For his final work... Reynolds took another famous figure of the London stage. This is the actress Sarah Siddons, playing the part of the tragic muse, and we can see immediately that Reynolds intended more than just a simple portrait of her. Reynolds' portrait of Sarah Siddons is perhaps one of the places where one can see the influence of Michelangelo most strongly, and in particular, of course, Michelangelo's great Sistine ceiling. He asked her to sit as, um, as tragedy, and at one point she was looking up, I think, to the wall at a picture of something that he'd painted, and uh, he, he suddenly realised that this was the sort of um, expression that he'd seen in the Sistine Chapel. So he, he captured that expression uh, that, he, that he had seen from the Sistine Chapel and, and converted Mrs Siddons into a sort of uh, inferior Sistine Chapel picture. There are some ways in which it's very different from Michelangelo, and perhaps the most obvious way is the very different sense of atmospherics. Uh, Michelangelo, who is painting in fresco, paints in a very hard and very firm manner, brilliant draftsmanship, uh, bright colours, strong effects. Um, Reynolds is painting in a much more atmospheric way. He's showing lots of clouds, lots of darkness. And whereas um, Michelangelo's Isaiah is part of an architectural structure, you can see all the uh, spandrels and things going on around, uh, Mrs. Siddons is floating in the clouds. So she's not actually attached to anything firm like the Michelangelo. She's in this kind of ethereal space. So you might say that, in a way, he's brought together Rembrandt and Michelangelo together, the managing of atmospherics on the one hand and then this heroic pose on the other. This was to be amongst the final artistic efforts of Reynolds. In 1789, hampered by illness and increasing blindness, his artistic output stopped. On February the 23rd, 1792, at his home in London, the life of the great artist came to its end. Nine days later, St Paul's Cathedral witnessed his funeral, a remarkable gathering of English society figures 
all keen to honor the man who had painted so many of them during his lifetime. It was an unprecedented event, entirely appropriate for a man whose efforts elevated English art forever. Sir Joshua Reynolds will always be one of the greatest of the English masters. Prior to Reynolds' time, British connoisseurs had tended to rather look down on artists. They could tell them what to do, um, and they often did, but they didn't think that artists had intellectual dignity themselves. Now Reynolds turns this on his head. He shows he's as good as them. He can think as well as them. He's as much of a connoisseur as them. He can write as well as any writer. Um, he is somebody who sets the profession on a truly professional basis.